Being a park ranger means being prepared for literally anything. We often wear many hats and act as communication between lots of different service providers and even authorities. We can be search and rescue, doctors, ER doctors, police, teachers, and sometimes even parents. We always have our wits about us, or at least try to, and you get used to certain sights, sounds, and smells, depending on which branch of ranger you are. The search and rescue obviously deal with more grisly situations. Now, before I started this, roadkill would make me have especially the smell on a hot summer's day. Whilst I by no means enjoy it, I am just kind of used to it. I've seen hikers that have taken a fall, shins sticking up to their legs. I've seen arms and ankles bent the wrong way. Even a car crash that happened near us that we were called in for extra assistance since there were parts all over the highway. That was bad, but at least there was a reasonable account for why I handed a CSI a part of the human body I was not able to identify. What I found one day on a seemingly routine check way deep into the park where barely anybody goes could not so easily be explained. One of the things I really enjoy most about the job is the freedom. Yes, we all have a role to play, but unless there is something specific going on, we can travel to any part of the vast parkland that was like and work in that area. I had chosen a remote location because of the very fact it seldom gets visited, and therefore, sometimes we are lucky enough to discover young over there and varying different species I wanted to see if there was anything new to log, especially any of our lesser populated animals. There isn't much of a proper trail out there. We do maintain some sort of pathway for the most part. It is kept for nature and overgrown. It's too far out for any adventurous school of scouting groups, and the majority of hikers head in the opposite direction. This was springtime and early morning, still fairly warm, and all of a sudden, the smell hit me. It wasn't super strong, but enough that I knew exactly what it was. Blood. Of course, I wasn't alarmed. We do have an occasional bear here and there, and other animals who stalk and eat each other. After all, this is the wild. However, what I was in no way expecting to find was a human hand nailed to a tree trunk. It had been hacked off the wrist. I say that because this was not a clean surgical cut. The edge of the skin was raggedy, bits of tissue dangling off. The blood I could smell had pooled at the bottom of the tree, staining the ground this darkish brown color. The blood had coagulated and had been there at least a few days. There was a lot of flat activity, but nothing else had been along to nibble at it, so it seemed. Possibly because it was nailed about eight feet off the ground. I, of course, called it in, and my boss called the police. We helped them do a full sweep of the area, but did not find any other body parts. They told us after doing a full investigation... Nobody had been to any of the local hospitals with a missing hand. The prints and blood did not match anything on record. All they could tell was that it was a middle-aged white man. We'll never know how it got there. Why there was no other evidence like blood anywhere else or footprints, tire tracks, and just how on earth it got nailed up that far onto the tree. We also now routinely check that area, just in case keeping the pathways a little clearer. Nothing else has happened since, though. Thank God. I was helping to supervise a middle school overnight camping trip when something extremely terrifying happened. I'm a ranger, and oftentimes I help out with any educational or scouting groups. Kids can be great fun, 
and I have a lot of fun with them. Coming from a big family myself, I have a lot of experience with siblings and even younger cousins. Sometimes on these trips, one of the kids gets scared. Even as middle schoolers, the woods are dark and can sometimes make strange noises and add into the spooky campfire tales we like to lightly scare them with. It's no wonder that one or two of them end up with nightmares. And sometimes, especially if they are already spooked, their eyes can play tricks on them. One little kid was obviously upset and trying not to show it after listening to the famous dog licking your hand under the bed story. A short while, with everybody set up in their tents, there was a tap on mine, asking if I'd walk him over to the bathrooms. There is a creek behind them, which you know is pretty convenient. And all of a sudden, I heard a scream, and he came running back, saying he'd seen a figure. I had told him to run back to the tents as I had a good look around. I couldn't see anybody, but a few moments later, I was joined by one of the teachers. When the kid had gotten back to the tents, he'd been so upset that he'd tumbled straight into the faculty tent, told them that somebody was trying to murder him. I told the poor member of staff that that wasn't quite correct, what the kid had told me, that he'd seen a figure and that I'd made a sweep of the area. I couldn't find any trace of anybody being there, other than us. Still, just to be on the safe side, we reported it back to base. We always have extra staff on and somebody remains in the office when we have kids on site. And my calling Joe was on all night long. He promised to make some routine checks. He let us know immediately if he saw nor came across anything that might put the campers in danger. It was very much protocol, but we didn't think for a moment anything would actually happen. Even though I was 99.9% .9 sure the kid had just imagined it due to spooky stories and the fact that it was so dark, it had still unnerved me. Maybe some of his fear had rubbed off. Now, I wasn't scared, but I did feel a sense of trepidation. Since I couldn't sleep, I sat on a lawn chair outside of my tent, keeping on my flash and being very glad of my Kindle. I stayed awake pretty much all night, waving at Joe every now and again as he passed by, being extremely grateful when he brought me another cup of coffee around 3 a.m. About 6 a.m.-ish, the kids began to wake up, and sure enough, soon there was a line needing to use the bathroom. I had not taken the kids this time, but suddenly, there was another scream, and so naturally I rushed over. This time, a little girl was flooding with tears, claiming she had seen a body in the water. I got the teachers to take all the children back to the site and pack up immediately. I radioed Joe. Then, I stepped around the back of the restroom block, over to the creek. Now that it was light out, I could see far better, and I could even make out that, yes, there was indeed a figure or a body in there. Quickly, I took a photo on my cell, radioed to Joe to cancel any 911 calls. The children and teachers were hysterical when I arrived back at camp. I called for all of them to hush so I could explain what happened, but that we were ultimately safe. I then pulled out my cell, showed the faculty member in charge the photo i just taken. She looked at the boy from last night and the little girl who was still in tears and burst out laughing. Come here, kids, she said, in that kind of firm but kind way only teachers seem to possess. They went over to her, and she showed them the photo, zooming in on the body. At first, they looked scared, then confused, and then finally relieved. I'm sure they'll see the funny side one day when they are older and less traumatized. Otherwise, they'll have to always be mindful when visiting. You see, floating in the creek was a large garden gnome, 
I definitely imagine it looked terrifying to the kid in the dark, even to the little girl in the morning, who had no doubt heard the rumors about a mysterious figure. We have no idea how this gnome ended up in the creek. The park isn't exactly a hot spot for fly tipping, and the nearest home is miles away. We kept him in the office afterwards, calling him Richie, after the kid who thought he was an axe murderer. Sorry this story isn't scary, but more funny than anything else. I work as a ranger out in Pennsylvania, and we have a very large cave system. We have to monitor this. Although the area is checked on fairly regularly, there are parts that are so remote, they probably have never ever been recorded. Like, unless we are actively doing a search and rescue, we don't head out there. So, when we report that something or cavers had been exploring and come across a crime scene, we aren't that surprised at all. Since they said there wasn't any bodies or injured parties, we headed over to check it out before filing our own report to the sheriff. What we found was really weird. The first off, my buddy swore that he'd been in this particular cave before. But some of the items we found were years old. And I mean decades. There were old cans in there with expiry dates back from the 1970s. The crime scene the explorers had alluded to was actually a bloody shirt hanging on the wall of the cave. Again, it looked really old. Maybe not as old as the food cans, but certainly nothing recent. Further inspection came up with three more things. A human femur, clean with no marking, suggesting injuries. A well-read paperback book, a copy of The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, published in 2003, and a word that had been scratched somehow onto the cave wall, probably with a knife or a jagged rock. It simply spelled out help. Of course, we called the police. They ran some tests, did some digging, but ultimately, it all led to a dead end. Pretty creepy, though. Especially the vast amount of time difference between the items. Old food cans from the 70s, and a book from a little over 15 years ago. Who needed help? And if they died in that cave, why was just a femur left? Where was the rest of them? I'm about 49 now, about to be 50, and I'm no longer in the forest service industry anymore, but I have some tales that will scare the hell out of you. I don't have time to sit down and write them all out, but there is one that comes to mind that I will share with you, since you seem to be obsessed with deep woods, park rangers, and strange things. The year was 1995. I'll never forget it. Mainly because I went through a lot of stuff that year. A divorce, both my parents passing, among some other personal tragedies and hardships I was forced to endure. But beside that, that was also the year... I experienced some strange things while in the job. But more importantly, a good colleague of mine, who we became very close friends while we worked together alongside as rangers. While him and I both have our fair share of strange, creepy experiences, there's one that really sticks out that happened in June of 1995. I'll never forget it. I was out doing my rounds and I got a call over the radio. He told me that he was pretty sure he was being followed, and that he was being terrified, stalked by some large men. Of course, I radioed back, asking him what he meant. A little side note. My colleague, we'll call him David, since I won't be revealing his real name, was out in a section of the park that is much more secluded. In fact, there's no trails over there. There are no hikers. There's no camping. No reason for anybody to be back there. But I guess there had been some issues back there that our supervisor wanted him to go check out. After going there and seeing that there was no issues at all, which the original issue was, I believe my supervisor was under the impression there was a small camp out, or possibly a homeless camp. I'm not exactly sure, 
my memory doesn't serve me all that well on that detail. Anyway, after arriving back, which, by the way, this was also in the evening, he radios over to me, saying that he is completely terrified, that these large men are chasing him. I tell him he's okay, and to just make it back as quick as he can. We agree to meet back at the station. Probably about 45 minutes later, I'm already there, waiting for my shift to get over, and he pops in, and I've never seen him so white in my life. Now, my colleague is a white boy, but he was very, very white. I'm talking, there's no other color in his skin other than pale, and the look on his face is completely terrified. Funny, I didn't think Irishman, because he is Irish, could get any more pale than that. Already being fair-skinned, he was so terrified, he just came and sat down, and we started talking. I asked him, what happened out there? He explained to me that, you're never going to believe this, but these giant wild hairy men chased me, nearly grabbing me. It's like they let me go. Had I not gone fast enough, they would have gotten to me. When I questioned him, saying, what do you mean wild hairy men? There's none of that out there. Do you mean, did you maybe see a bear? Are there monkeys or something? He just shook his head and looked at me. He said no. These beings that chased after him were around 8 to 9 feet tall, incredibly massive, covered in long hair, with faces that were very human. He said they looked like primitive humans, kind of like cavemen or Neanderthals, but giant, and they had black eyes. He was completely terrified. He said there was about four or five of them, and they flanked him, nearly overturning his vehicle. They chased him out of there and almost wonders if maybe that was where their village was or their territory. I didn't mean to laugh at him, but I kind of just smirked, thinking, great, now we have a village of wild hairy men living in the park. My supervisor will love hearing this. Of course, I didn't fully believe him at the time, and I just figured maybe he had some sort of life situation happen that caused him to see things that weren't there. So... I gave him a pat on the back, a hug, let him know I'm here for him if he wants to talk. Later on, the next day, my supervisor was told about what happened and pulled me into the office. He sat me down and explained, did you hear what had happened with David? I explained to him, yes, I had. He looked at me with the most stern and serious look I've ever seen on my supervisor's face, which, by the way, is a pretty jovial, happy guy always cracking jokes, a prankster, if you will. This man has not been serious a day on the job in his life, so to see him like this, something was wrong. He leans over the table, maybe eight inches away from my face, and says, whatever David told you is not to leave this building or this park. Do you understand me? I will never forget those words. He was so intent on his meaning not understanding and not being willing to question my boss's motives. I just nodded my head yes, and he says, okay, good. Now, get on your duty. Leave my office. Was something to those lines. I got up, pushed in my chair, and walked out. Very strange, right? Well, that's part one. So, in the coming years, obviously that encounter or experience was kind of forgotten about by me since David and my boss didn't really bring it up again. Well, over the next four years, from 95 to 99, there was expansion on the park, particularly trails and camping, that of course branched further out of that area. Now, where David was, was probably about 4.7 miles away from the station, over in that direction, northeast to be specific. With trails and camping areas expanding, from 95 to 99, we had more encounters, I should say, or at least complaints from fellow hikers and campers. At around 98 is when a lot of the development was fully finished. Even going into the spring of 99, where new trails were established and more camping spots were created. Probably within a mile or two 
northeast in the same direction. This is when we began getting more and more complaints. People seeing strange men out in the woods. Figures. Horrible screams at night. This is when I began to put the pieces together and realized maybe David wasn't so crazy after all. My boss would not even speak on the issue. And as he told me before, whatever I learn, hear, see, or say is to be kept hush and not be spoken to outside of anybody within this park. I understood that enough that if I were to break that code of conduct, my career would be on the line. And I wasn't risking that, at least not at the time. But for me, I dealt with a lot of campers and hikers who had all sorts of stories from 98 to 99, right when this new development was pretty much being fully finalized. People were giddy to explore new areas and walk new trails. There was one loop in particular. I can't remember the name, but it did this big five-mile loop, and of course, it cut right through that northeast section, the same area in which David drove through. That's the same area in which people had complaints, seeing strange figures, hearing terrible noises, feeling like they were unsafe or being watched. Of course, me and David were called to investigate it almost every time. While I never saw or experienced anything myself, at least not until 2002, which I'll get to in another email, David had more encounters. And it eventually got so bad that by fall, November-ish, around 1999, we had to shut down the area entirely. Not the park, just this specific trail loop in parts of camping spots in this area. As I reflect and look back on all this, I almost wonder, did we come across Bigfoot territory? Maybe we encroached on their area. I don't know. At the time, I knew nothing of Bigfoot. Had I did, I don't even think that would have been something I believed in. Because it wasn't until I saw one in 2002 myself, working as a ranger in a separate park, that I became a full-on believer and started really researching, deep diving into not just cryptozoology, but Bigfoots in general. I apologize in advance if this story is kind of short-lived and I don't feel like there's a whole lot more I can add, which I'll continue in part two. But either way, some scary stuff happened in that park. A few years ago, I experienced something that was terrifying. I'm actually lucky to still be around to tell the tale. I have a Great Dane, who, of course, we had to call Scooby. And just like her namesake, she's crazy. Adorable and a very good family pet. But unlike her lazy laid-back cartoon version, our Scooby has boundless energy and needs a lot of exercise. Luckily for her, I like to jog, so oftentimes, after dropping the kiddos off at school, Scoob and I would head off to one of the running trails in the woods. I felt it good to burn off some energy, absorb some much-needed vitamin D, and, of course, burn those calories. One day, we were heading to our usual route, and we saw that the trail had been blocked off. Apparently, there had been a fallen tree and some damage to the surrounding area, this was due to a storm the night before. The worker was putting up a sign to tell joggers to avoid the path, suggesting an alternative route not too far away. It did lead further into the trees, he said, but wound up in the far parking lot at the other end of the wooded area. I hadn't been that way for years, since it is quite a bit longer, but since we didn't really have a choice and Scooby was always bouncing up and down, I decided to give it a try. Now, I may be a lone female, but I am sensible. I know, and plan my routes. I text my husband when I leave the house. When I return, I don't wear earbuds. This way, I can always be prepared for what's going on around me. I never run at night, and most importantly, I have a giant security guard with me at all times. Scooby may be a softy when it comes to her family, but she is also very protective. 
And that doesn't mean she didn't slobber all over strangers, of course. It just meant that she somehow sensed we were always safe. Being on a new trail, of course, meant a lot of excitement. Stopping to sniff and go potty every few minutes. There was just so many new things to smell and leave her scent on. Her tail was wagging constantly. She kept making happy little yaps every now and again. I was smiling. All was well. And I watched her bound over to some bushes. Scare a poor woodchuck. She never hurts them. I honestly think she just doesn't know how big she is and wants to play. I was still chuckling at the look on the woodchuck's face when all of a sudden she stops in the middle of the trail and went stiff. Again, like a cartoon dog. When Pluto acts like a pointer for Mickey, she was standing still, just staring at something up ahead. The hackles rose on the back of her neck, and I heard a noise I don't hear very often. A low and angry growl. She did not seem frightened, more alert and on edge. Ready to attack, which is highly unusual behavior. She got down low, and I could see her teeth were bared as she continued to growl. I didn't want to frighten her by calling out, and to be honest, she was making me nervous. Not because I thought that she might do something to me, but because I trusted her instinct. If she was unhappy, then something was wrong. I just had no clue as to what it might be. She suddenly leapt full pelt into the bushes in front of her, and I heard a shout. At first, I was concerned she'd hurt somebody, although my thought process quickly turned to what on earth somebody was doing behind those bushes. I could hear her growling and barking, and there was some rustling, so I called to her sharply to get back to me. As I said, she's a very good dog, so when she didn't come on my first command, I was surprised, rose my voice. Scooby, here. This time, she did as she was told. I heard another yell from whoever was in the bush as Scooby came running back over to me. I could just make out a hooded figure running away. It was all in the shadows of trees and on the other side of the bushes. It was really blurry, just like the silhouette of a person that I could see. I didn't bother calling out to them to check if they were okay, as they seemed to be wanting to get away real quick and were still shaken from Scooby's reaction. I looked down at her, and she had this sort of sorry mom look in her face and eyes. She was also holding a torn piece of green fabric in her mouth. I took it from her. It looked like it was sweater material. I guess she must have ripped it from this person's hoodie. Now, instead of heading the same way as the bush hider, we turned back and made our way back to the start. The worker was gone now. Just the sign blocking the usual trail remained. We headed home, and I called my husband to tell him we were back and what had happened. He surprised me by saying that he was coming straight home, and that I should call the police. When I asked why, he asked if I had read the news this morning. I had not. I'd planned on grabbing a coffee and sitting on the porch after reading it, after the jog. He told me to quickly look at it, whilst he drove home, then called the detective mentioned on the front of the page. I grabbed the paper and gasped as I read the story. Local police were looking for a young man who had raped and killed at least three different women. There had only been one witness so far, as the killer tended to hide in quiet and secluded wooded areas, preying on lone women. He hadn't realized one of his victims had been waiting for their teenage son to catch up. He'd caught a very quick glimpse of his mom's attacker before he'd taken a knock to the head and passed out. All he could remember was that the killer was young, male, and apparently wearing a green hoodie. Also said to be seen within this radius... There are all sorts of things that you can find in the woods. They have often been the setting for dark tales and believable ghost stories. 
depending on your point of view. The deeper you get into the forest could be magical, if you believe in fairies, educational, if you enjoy nature and learning about foliage, or downright terrifying, if you believe in monsters. This story that I'm about to share with you happened to me within the last year, and it's safe to say I will never be the same again. Since we were in the middle of COVID restrictions, I had to appease my wanderlust and travel bug by staying local. It actually gave me a much needed push to discover some of the huge parks and forests that surround me in my own part of SoCal. There was enough to keep me going for years on my own doorstep. One of the best things about hiking, that it's totally socially distanced. On the day in question, I had already decided that I was going to head as far into the woods as possible. I'd even brought some meager supplies along, including a pop-up tent, just so I can camp out, not having to be tied to the timings of daylight. The few hikers I had seen on recent trips were totally okay with a curt nod, no idle chit-chat, and staying apart in masks. I was fine with that. In fact, I hadn't seen another person for the entire day on this whole trek. Not even a ranger. I was more than happy with that. Looking back, there was very little animal activity, but at the time, I didn't really notice. As the sun began to lower and a cool breeze descended, along with a super loud growl from my belly, alerting me to the fact it was way past dinner, I decided to stop and set up camp for the night being. I was just getting myself sorted, clearing the area for a small fire, when I heard the voice. Now, of course, I don't own those woods. I didn't have the sole right to be there, but not having seen or heard anything at all for the entirety, and now suddenly, a voice appearing out of nowhere was a little unnerving. I hadn't been able to make out exactly what the person had said. It was kind of muffled, but I called back a cordial hello in response, since that seemed to be the thing to do. Again, just a muffled grunting sound, and I began to wonder if it was actually an animal instead. If you don't know, you'd be surprised just how human certain sounds from certain creatures can be. Like a deer, expelling breath can sound exactly like a human cough or a sneeze. Then there was also a terrible smell. Even now, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was, or even what it reminded me of. The closest thing I would say would be old eggs or a blocked sink drain. That almost sulfurous odor, which is utterly repellent. There was some rustling. I expected some survivor type to come racing out of the bushes, filthy, stinking, muttering garbage due to starvation, or just something, but nobody came out. Are you okay in there? I felt compelled to ask, not really wanting to hear no as a reply. But I didn't get any kind of answer, and there was no more noise. The smell, however, remained, partially covered by the smoke from the small fire that I made. If I hadn't been so tired, and it wasn't so incredibly dark, I might have moved camp, but unbelievably, despite feeling a little on edge, I fell deep asleep pretty quickly. And man, it must have been literally the deepest sleep I have ever been in, as when I woke up around 5am, all hell had broke loose. My tent, only being small and not intended to be highly durable anyway, had been ripped to pieces. The shredded material flapping in the morning breeze. The few belongings I had in my backpack had been emptied out and scattered. The tin of chili I was intending to have for breakfast smashed open and eaten. The small fire was out, and by the smell of it, it had been doused with urine. Something had peed on it to put it out, and it was strong. The ammonia actually stung my eyes. It looked for all intents and purposes like an animal attack, although I was completely uninjured, thank God. 
The strangest thing of all, though, were the two sets of footprints in the dirt surrounding the carnage. Well, there were three, actually. I recognized my own set of hiking boots. The other two were harder to explain. One set definitely appeared human, although barefoot rather than a shoe print, and the other, well, the thing it most resembled was a goat, I guess, that cloven hoof. Was I attacked by a barefooted man with a pet goat, who just so happened to have sharp enough fingernails to rip through my tent, sharp enough teeth to pierce a tin can, and strong enough urine to make my eyes sting? I grabbed the few salvageable items and hot-footed it out of there as fast as I could. The whole experience was scary, but despite that most of all, I'm thankful that, for whatever reason, whatever that was did not attack me, and that somehow, despite the activity, I remained peacefully unaware in my sleep. This is going to be a relatively long camping story, told by somebody who doesn't speak English as a native language. So please, be understanding. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear and such. So yeah, my parents were legitimately afraid for me and were very against the idea. I had to lie to them and say that we would stay in a hotel near a national park just so they would get off my back. Obviously, that is not what we did. So, long story short, we had to travel from around this area to this park, which was around 200 kilometers in a two-hour train ride. We got our immense backpacks, everything we needed, and went on our way. Nothing specifically happened in the train, except for the fact the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being completely empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited, thinking that we had that whole compartment all to ourselves. As I said, it is a very rare thing to happen. Of course, after 10 to 20 minutes goes by, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular, I usually find my way around to all animals, even those the people I don't like. Not this dog, though. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed, as if it was a stuffed animal. He would listen to his owner's every single command. I was impressed by it, so obviously. I start asking the man about his dog, since it would be a long and awkward trip to do in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog, except the commands he would give to his dog. No other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name, which in Romanian means the killer. It's a very weird name to give to a dog, because for this example, we would use the English word as it is, not translate to the word Romanian the name of the dog like that but I thought to each their own. I asked him, why such a scary name? And he bluntly replied, this dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and the only thing he is truly good at. Personally, I consider that the dog will grow up to have a very similar personality to his owner. And most times, I would judge people with dogs on how that animal reacts to the world and to his or her owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe. I brushed everything over, thinking to myself that maybe this guy is training his dog to hunt. Then, I started thinking which woods are legal to even hunt in our country. While I was thinking that, the guy, out of nowhere, asks us if we are traveling to the same national park. That was surprisingly accurate considering that the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station, long before we ever found our seats, and way longer before we ever met this man. 
Again, I thought it was nothing, because in my country, people who happen to go in the same direction will try and make small talk. Guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination, or be honest. I took the honesty route, and I am judging myself for that. Never be too honest with strangers, or honest at all after you read the story. We confirmed we are going to that place, asked what else is to see around, since he began talking about the area, and, well, considering we knew nothing about the place, we took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, the animals, that all we can encounter, told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom base of the mountain that we need to climb, advised us to visit the low tree shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it to try out the local restaurant. When this guy began talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud clink. What surprised me was the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination, said our pleasant goodbyes. The man waves at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turn around, back right away, because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was. The man and dog were no longer there. Not just that, but his luggage was also gone. That creeped me out a bit, but who cares? We were too thrilled for our first camping experience. We start walking with our backpacks on us, 10 kilograms each, and reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during night, would make your hair stand straight. Lucky for me, we traveled during a daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end by the time we got to the middle of it, and we hear a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog, crying in desperation. We stop. My boyfriend looks at me with his, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face, tries to convince me to take a different route entirely. We don't. I hear the dog, I go right towards the sound, and in the middle of the road, I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles on his butt crying so hard and laying on the cement, looking hurt, as if hit by a car. I freeze and think to myself that our trip is now over. I have to save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears up gets up and, like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. Like one kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone had threw her in the river to kill her, wet, cold, and hungry. Of course we took her, too. So here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks each, two puppies at my chest, boyfriend with the map, trying to find a spot to camp the first night. We pass by the monastery the man in the train had mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we could not enter in the building. The priests would not allow it, so we just walked around the property, through the gardens, until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats, because the second you put them down and forced them to walk on their own, they would slam down on the ground. We walk and walk and walk until we decide to stop because it was beginning to get late and I was starting to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark type cottage right in the middle of the woods. We called it Troyanitsa, 
It's like a scouting post, but for the church, where they place religious icons or a Bible, stuff like that, inside to bring good energy to the area. It belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house. Basically a roof with four small walls and an opening, not a door. You could go in, hide from the rain. There was an icon inside, and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible, really annoyed to see that people would write down their names in it, like couples do on the tree. But one particular page, the words, I will find you, stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably somebody who wanted to scare travelers with silly messages. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, make the fire, unpack, make food and eat. We feed puppies which are now cuddled up in our tent. And finally, darkness starts to rise all around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off, it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer to us than in reality. Now it's around 12 a.m. We are all in the tent, cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up, unzip the tent, and put them out to pee. They do, and I get them back in. They cry some more, and the smallest one begins shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is up too. He hears it as well. The fire is fading. The moment he unzips the tent and steps out, the sound disappears into the woods. It sounded like a snake, slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, Was that a snake? He says, up to this day, he cannot explain what he saw. He says it was a slithery figure with feet that made a sort of snort sound, like when the light hit it. The puppies calmed back down after this creature ran into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's now 3 a.m. This time we wake up the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead, and we clearly have no idea to put up a sustaining fire. My boyfriend gets up to search for firewood, and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness, and I swear... I hear whispers coming from between the trees. I look up at the sky, considering it's only 3 a.m., and hear birds being very loud, flooding their wings. I'm no expert in birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these weren't. They were very active, vocal, and very frustrated. I look at the fire, follow the red sparks popping out of it into the sky, and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from a hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary for me. It created an illusion hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, creating a track for me, probably, but to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burns out. None of them did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow into the woods. At that moment, I began to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds being agitated. The mysterious light pointing us to go deeper in the woods. And all the trees around us has eyes on them. Like the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked exactly like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal, since somebody explained that those shapes from when a branch is ripped from the root, and that's the shape that is left after. But, uh, there were so many, like a hundred eyes, all looking at the exact spot we decided to camp, having only that religious tiny landmark to mentally protect us. And as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, 
like 10 meters away from us. Obviously, I stand my ground, but don't go near it. Suddenly, a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out of it and, half inside the bush, half outside, stares at us. I called my boyfriend, and we're both like, what is that? A bear cub? A wolf? A pig? The creature shakes its head the same way a dog does after a bath, and I hear a distinguished clink, like a dog collar. At this time, my boyfriend manages to light up the fire really big, which scares this animal to run back into the woods, through the bush from which it initially came out of. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again during the night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep. The puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open just a little, just enough to have my eye peek through it, right at the early mentioned bush. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep to that bush. All of a sudden, I hear a noise coming from that direction, and I immediately wake up my boyfriend, who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts me. From that exact same bush, we see a human head popping out, looking towards our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough to not make it look like you were being watched from the inside of the tent. This head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin white. We thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, a full torso, a leg. Bit by bit, an entire man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted both by the moon and our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, basically extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This is all happening like two to three meters away from our tent. I look at the man with horror because I recognized him. And now the clink I heard earlier from the animal is explained. It is the same man from the train with his dog. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us. But this guy was there with us since 12 a.m. at least because our fire would be dead every two to three hours, and we would be woken up by the sound of branches being cracked, rocks being moved, which we internally explained as animals crossing. After he successfully managed to put out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging into it bit by bit, until only his head would be out, with a very disfigured-looking mouth. Yuri tried to go back to sleep after that, we didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, lit ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit that I did fall asleep while sitting down next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up. I was too afraid to go near that distance bush. I did not need any answers, any explanations. I just wanted a daylight to get out of there, and we did. We packed our stuff and we got out. We planned a four-day camping trip, and this experience made us give up after that first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that thing followed us, or it was just a coincidence, it was more than enough. As a conclusion to my story, and advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas close to your destination, to strangers. Anyway, stay safe. Always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that come to you under the form of sounds, movements, changes of temperature, and so on. I'm going to keep my details and my identity pretty anonymous and vague, just for my own protection, in case, for whatever reason, 
the wrong person listens and hears this. I know I might be overly paranoid sounding, but you can never be too sure with sharing such sensitive information. Years back, for about seven months, I worked as a park ranger, as well as participating in some search and rescues. It wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And in fact, I experienced some very strange things that I feel it's important to talk about. The people whom I worked with, I still have fairly good relationships with, at least most of them, even though this is well over eight, nine years ago. Before I get to anything, let me just say that before this job, I did not believe in the entire alien UFO phenomenon. I thought it was a huge hoax, just made up stuff to put on the internet for people's entertainment. But after my seven months on the job, well, my opinion changed. And let me tell you why. We had at least four instances that I can recount on the top of my head. Probably more if I really try to sit down and think about it. Instances of people disappearing and reappearing for a considerable amount of time that did not make sense. The first being an older lady, roughly 68 or 67, fairly good shape, hiking by herself, and just vanished. Vanished like there was no trace of her left. I do very vividly remember the search and rescue mission looking for her. The dogs would stop and start whining right on the spot that she disappeared. We could not find any trail scent. We could not find any trace of her belongings or clothes. She was heavily equipped. Backpack, camping equipment and all. And very survival smart. We found nothing. About six weeks go by, and she's there, same trail as always, coming back the direction she came from, acting strange when people were reacting to her, saying that she had only been gone for maybe an hour at most. Apparently, she had no idea that it was now roughly six weeks later, and was shocked when proven on the calendar and other sources of technology that proved to her that six weeks did indeed pass. So what happened? Did she just walk into another dimension and come back? It doesn't make any sense. I should also add that there was nothing wrong with her. No clothing marks, no dirt. She hadn't even aged. Of course, you're not going to age in six weeks, really. But you know what I mean. She looked exactly the same, clothing and all, as the day she disappeared. When she was taken into custody and interviewed, she said that she just hiked, went down the trail, and came back like nothing ever happened. The only major difference here is that on the day she disappeared, it was very, very sunny, and on the day she came back, there was considerable amounts of overcast. When asked about that, she simply stated that on her way back down the trail, a considerable amount of cloud coverage occurred, meaning overcast. Now, there's a lot of speculation around this story, specifically her. Some say she was abducted by aliens, as that's the only real thing that could explain the passing of time and her not changing any shape, form, and remaining perfectly intact just as the day she was. Compare that to other similar phenomenons around other people going missing and turning up months later, sometimes years later, in exactly the same state they were when they disappeared. Also having absolutely no knowledge of them ever disappearing in the first place, or if it is, it's very vague like they saw a white light, or something along those lines. This lady had no idea she was ever gone. The month she disappeared was early April to around mid-May. There was also speculation that she walked into a time portal, somehow. Again, no real evidence to back that up. I thought the alien thing was a lot more plausible. And at the time, it really freaked me out, but still wasn't a nail in the coffin yet. And then it would happen again, in June. Two small boys, actually. Twins. Four years old. I'll never forget these boys, named Jacob and Isaac, both wearing white shirts and blue coveralls. Very sweet little boys. They disappeared early June. Last seen, chasing or playing tag, running around in circles around a big fir tree. The next thing you know, they're gone. No trace of them. Same thing ensued. A large seven-day search and rescue mission. 
found absolutely no trace of them. Parents, after about a month, were convinced they were dead, had a funeral service, they moved on with life as best they could. Then, right around Labor Day, I think it was about three days after, to be exact, so maybe September 14th, if my dates are correct, they appeared exactly the same state they were in, and you'll never get this, running around the same fir tree they were running around when they were last seen, still playing tag, still in the exact same clean white shirt and blue coveralls, same haircut, they hadn't missed a meal, they looked perfectly healthy and content, the same day as they left, like the previous woman and other accounts. They had no idea time had even passed, and at this point, it had easily been three months since their disappearance. Officials, police, and their parents, nobody could explain their disappearance, what happened, or how it happened. But a similar situation where the parents took their eyes off their boys for just a moment to grab something while they were cooking, and boom, gone. This one also freaked us out. We got a chance to talk to the boys, me specifically. They had no idea anything ever happened. Their account, as the best of four-year-olds can give, is they were playing around a fir tree. Next thing you know, mom and dad have different clothes on, different haircuts, just basically a four-year-old's recounting of how mom and dad now look a little bit different because three months had passed and dad might have a little bit of a beard and mom's hair might be a little bit longer or shorter. You know, the best a four-year-old can describe. And like the lady before them, absolutely no trace of them going anywhere or having any sort of memory of where they were. Were they abducted and experimented on by aliens? I don't know. It's hard to say. But this one for me really sealed the deal. But then there would be two others. These two were also very strange. This next man, I won't mention his last name, but his first name was Martin. He was 38 years old, had apparently disappeared three years prior to this happening, and this would have been the beginning of October, suddenly reappeared in the same clothing and everything he had on the day he had disappeared. I believe he had disappeared about three and a half years earlier, although his account was a little bit different than the previous. He tells us, when he was eventually found and interviewed, that a bright light engulfed him, and for a while he was wandering around in complete whiteness. Yes, he used the word whiteness, like a void of nothing but light and white, if that makes any sense. Although something of that description is really hard to even understand. He says during this time, he had no idea of any time passing. He also felt no feelings in his body, like hunger, sleep deprivation, thirst, bathroom, or any of that. He claims he has no idea how long he was there, but wondered aimlessly for what felt like months if not years, but in all actuality said it was probably only 5 or 10 minutes. He claims it was almost an out-of-body experience. The next thing you know, everything goes back down in light. He described the words as it dimming down, and then he was back here, in his body, in the same clothes he wore. He was not lying on the ground unconscious. In fact, he was still very much alert. He was surprised more than anybody else that three and a half years had fully passed and it was now October because when he disappeared, I believe it was March for him three years prior. Now, this very last one to me is by far the weirdest and once I tell you, you'll understand why. So, we found this man about two weeks after Martin and to be honest with you, if the two boys, Jacob and Isaac, hadn't sealed the deal, there's no way you could go through this case and not believe. This man, his name was Brandon. He was 46 years of age. Kind of an older guy. But here's the thing. He had been gone for seven years. Disappeared without a trace. And when he was found again, in the middle of the park, just out of nowhere... He was in almost these white-like robes, kind of like robes that a priest would wear at a temple. He had a very long beard, but looked very upkept, very clean. When he was asked about who he was and his identification, 
he seemed to be fully aware and cognizant of everything around him, even how much time had passed, and that he knew he had been gone. But it gets much weirder than this. When he was interviewed and asked, he said he was at the park on a trail, where he was taken and also, like the other man, engulfed in a white light. He said it was there that he met beings, and according to his time frame, spent 10 years in what Brandon described just like Martin, as a place full of light and void. He said these beings that he mentored under, he specifically used the word mentor, taught him several languages, which he didn't know before. Here's the other weird thing. They taught him full-on Chinese. I mean, he could speak it extremely fluently. After speaking to his family to make sure he's not crazy, he was never able to speak it before. So, now this man of seven years now all of a sudden returns, wearing white priest-like robes, with a long beard, very upkept, and weirdly can speak very fluent Chinese, more than enough to actually live in that country. And on top of that, says he learned it and was taught it by these white translucent beings in this white void in which he was engulfed by a white light and brought back the same way. Unlike Martin, he knew how much time had passed, and he knew he had been gone for X amount of time. But even though he was actually missing for seven years, he claims he was in this dimension for ten years. Now, I know what you're thinking, that this sounds absolutely insane, and I thought the same thing too. But when you get a chance to see this firsthand, to be on these search and rescue missions and to talk to these people, there's really no way to explain this thoroughly. I was feeling like I was living in an actual episode of The X-Files. I felt like I was in some sort of alternate universe. Nothing made sense. So the only thing I could really pinpoint is that there really must be alien life, and for whatever reason is abducting people. I can't really explain why all four of these people had different experiences, two having very similar experiences, and the other two having very similar experiences. It doesn't really make sense to me but I guess that doesn't matter in the long run. This kind of stuff happened, and shortly after Brandon had been found, I decided to quit. It was too much for me. I don't know how experienced park rangers or people in that service industry can handle it. I mean, it just goes beyond normalcy. With all of this said, do I really believe that UFOs or aliens had a hand in all of these things? Yes, I do. There's no other way to explain these weird abductions or lapses of time, or in Brandon's case, being taken, clothing being completely different, having a beard grown out, which, by the way, when he disappeared, was a clean-cut, clean-shaven guy, never knew a drop of Spanish or any other language besides English, and now apparently he comes back looking like a prophet of some religion, speaking full-blooded Chinese, nothing really makes sense. And his story, if you ever actually got the chance to sit there and listen to his two-hour recount of it, was just incredibly strange. I was only given bits and pieces, major components of his tale, but that these strange translucent spiritual beings taught him multiple languages, which apparently don't exist anymore, and he would not speak them for fear of a reason I can't remember but said they taught him full Chinese. You just think about how crazy that is, and how much it doesn't make sense. It scared the hell out of a lot of detectives and people working on that specific case. And many of us rangers, it spooked us. Because you clearly can't explain something like that. This was something truly supernatural, in every sense. Back in the late 1980s, during my high school years, I would often spend time after school goofing off with friends, graffiti, getting into mischief, and smoking a lot of cigarettes. Hell, I probably chain-smoked more than ever in my life, and for whatever reason, thought I was so cool doing it. In fact, me and three of my close friends would always meet up in this tiny little secluded wooded area just a few miles north of our house, always after school. I was a late bloomer on getting my license, so it's not like we ever drove around. Just kind of walked, hid, 
and smoked cigarettes, talked crap about friends, school life, family, and other kids we did not like, always having a cigarette. This would have been my senior year of high school, I remember, because all throughout my high school, I gradually began smoking more and more, until this point, which kind of killed it for me. So, in a way, I can kind of thank this experience for stopping my cigarette addiction, because I was too scared to return to this location, really the only place that I felt safe smoking cigarettes, to be honest. My family, being extremely Catholic, had they caught me, I probably would have been beat with a belt. Yes, still, even at 17 years of age. So, anyway, back to the story. We're back here in this little wooded secluded spot, tucked far away from anybody else's attention or knowledge of where we are. In fact, only me and a few of my friends even knew about this spot. It's kind of off a small little trail, but tucked in just enough to where you wouldn't even know it had you not gone the way I went. And since this was long before cell phones or smartphones, I wouldn't even use a payphone. I would often just tell my parents before school, hey, I'm going to go hang out with my friends after school and be back a little after dinner. And they were always pretty cool with it. Luckily, now that I've kind of set up the story and the background, we're sitting there in our little area, smoking a cigarette, talking crap, when all of a sudden, I felt the forest get really quiet around me. I shouldn't say forest. It's not like we were in the middle of nowhere in a dense, green, lush forest, like you probably are thinking. It was kind of a wooded area, but it wasn't so much extremely dense like you would think. I don't know, maybe like a national forest. This is more like a wooded area that was kind of cleared, at least the part we had come from, and behind us was a little bit thicker. Lots of brush and briar, thorns and all that. It was May or June, just about ready for graduation, so all the foliage was back in full bloom, making it very thick and muggy. And due to this, visibility wasn't the greatest, but you could still generally see around you. Like, if somebody was approaching us from the north, we could see, even though we were a little bit hidden behind the bushes and stuff. We were just in the middle of conversation when everything had gotten quiet. My friend was talking, and I remember shushing him and telling him to listen. We all kind of listened, and it was far too quiet. You could drop a pin on the ground and hear it. It was making me uncomfortable, and I remember asking why it had suddenly got so quiet. My friends and I were looking around. I felt like in unison. We were all expecting something to happen. What? We had no idea. Then... Like a crescendoing noise, we heard something large on two feet begin to approach us from the north, right behind us. It was slow, but very steady. We all began to turn our attention towards that direction. It sounded like a huge giant slowly approaching us. Not a casual walking speed or even running. Almost kind of like a small pitter-pattering if that's making any sense at all. But you can hear the thud, or feel it, and whatever was making it had great weight behind it. After maybe a couple more moments of hearing this pitter-pattering coming closer, we could see, out of the denseness and whatever light there was during that time of day, which was getting near dusk, this large black shape coming toward us. That was it for us. I was so terrified... We all threw our cigarettes down and ran out of there as quick as we could. What scares us even worse is this figure pursued us. It went even faster. The further down the trail we got, and it even sounded like it was gaining on us. But whatever it was was intelligent enough to stay behind the majority of brush so we couldn't really see it. It kept itself or themselves pretty well concealed and the most we could ever see was a large black silhouette. I couldn't tell you if it had hair, or a head, or any really important details. Just that it looked like a really large thing, or person, I guess. However, because it is about a three to four minute walk 
back to our little secluded spot to the sidewalk. This thing had plenty of time to gain on us, and at one point or another, felt like it could have reached out and grabbed one of us. Because my friends bolted off in front of me, I of course was the last one, the very one closest to whatever this thing was. And I'm telling you, I have never been more terrified in my life than I was in that afternoon. There were times that I swear it was right behind me, and I never looked back. I was living in a real-life monster movie, and too afraid to face whatever it was. We finally got down to the sidewalk and just grabbed our bikes without even looking, nearly stumbling and falling over on them, and it felt like we all went about 30 miles an hour on our bikes with how terrified and full of adrenaline we were. Once we got a little ways away, we stopped, took a breather, and kept checking behind us. We were now in a nearby neighborhood, about 5 or 10 minutes away from the sidewalk that you would use to take that little spot into the forest. We were scared, asking what that was. After a minute or so, my friend tried to calm us all down, saying somebody was just messing with us. But I told him, nobody is that large. Did you hear the weight behind it? And why would they or it chase us? The direction it came from is undeveloped land. As far as I remember, there was nothing out there. I think just woods for miles and miles. No houses or nothing. All the developed land and houses were to the east, west, and south of us, primarily the south, so there'd be no reason for anybody to be back there. I mean, it's not like anybody hunts back there or anything. And this was in May or June. So again, no reason why anybody should be back there. And also, I can't help but think of why somebody so large would be making such a loud sound. If somebody was trying to sneak up on us, why would they be thudding so loud? Had to weigh an enormous weight, since as it got closer, we could feel the vibrations on the ground. Just like in a video game or a movie, the thud, 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 and feel the shaking of the ground as this large, massive thing or person approached. It was the most terrifying experience I've had yet, as I explained to you, and in the grand scheme of things, in a positive way, I somehow kind of connected cigarettes to that experience, and it caused me to stop smoking after that. As far as what chased us out of the woods that day, I'll never know. I was probably seven or eight at the time this happened, and even though it's not necessarily a monster story, it still is a pretty crazy story when you hear it. So, I used to go play down by this small little creek with a couple of friends. By the way, I lived in a small town in north central Idaho, and we used to play by this creek just about every day in the summertime, until one day, one of my friends brought his dog whom he had had for a while, and at some point or another, I can't remember when or how, but the dog started digging something up that resembled a bone. Being seven, eight-year-olds, we thought it was the coolest thing in the world. We got sticks and began digging, only to come and find out that what the dog had found and what we had unearthed with our sticks was indeed part or a fragment of a human skull. We all screamed and freaked out, and I think my friend, I don't remember if he did it then, but somebody called the police, and it caused a full-blown investigation. I remember we were thoroughly questioned, asked how long it was there, you know, all the usual 20 questions that investigators ask. Anyway, as time went on, it turns out that a couple people were murdered a few years back, and both of their bodies were dumped in that same location where we used to play all the time as kids. I'm assuming that their bodies were buried right next to that creek, and we just so happened, or my friend's dog just so happened to dig a part of the skull of one of the missing individuals. From what I had heard through the grapevine, both remains were discovered right there next to that river. Still kind of gives me goosebumps even to this day to think about it. I don't live in Idaho anymore, but I've thought about returning and just visiting that creek just for fun. After that happened, of course, my parents wouldn't allow any of us back there. Not to mention, 
it had become a full-on investigation, so we weren't really allowed to tamper with any of that. But even after all that ended, and they got the remains, and it was all closed off, we still weren't allowed to go back there. In 2007, I went on a minor hunting expedition with my father while he hunted up in northern Canada. It was cold, harsh, but also an amazing experience to be out and one with nature. This wasn't the very first time I had gone out with my father either. He had taken me along several trips, but I'd never been in Canada, and I'd never been this far north. Besides the actual hunting trip itself, which, for the most part, went amazing. There is one part that really disturbs me, and has never quite left my memory banks, because I think back to it often, realizing that we are not on top of the food chain, and in fact, far from it. We had discovered a large cave along a rocky outcropping against a mountainside. Upon going in, we noticed the thick smell of blood and death. That's when we saw there was a lot of blood, coming out of the cave, as if something had bled and left the cavern. We thought this was strange, but it could have been from an animal of fight, potentially, and the injured animal leaving the cave. And after exploring just a wee bit further, my father and I made the most gruesome and disturbing discovery of that entire trip. So much so, that it still stands out in my mind, a fully grown grizzly bear, with its entire head and neck, completely ripped off. While we never found the head, the body was there, and with enough ample lighting, we saw the carnage that laid between us. In fact, there was so much blood that it was hard to even make sense of what had happened. It looked like there had been some sort of fight, although not much, since this grizzly bear clearly lost, and the head was missing. After looking... Well, my father did most of the looking. I tried to keep myself from puking. The smell was pretty bad, and the body had been there at least a day or two, so it was stinking pretty bad. My father inspected the wounds, grossed out and curious, far more than I was, and told me that whatever had done this clearly had ripped the head off this bear, looking at the wounds and the way the flesh was torn. And of course there was so much blood, you couldn't make out exactly the tracks or anything, like what animal had come in here, or what exactly had happened. You could even hardly make out what kind of struggle there was. So his best guess was that this bear was in its den, and it did look like a bear den. Something came into the cavern and ripped this bear's head clear off its body. Then, whatever it did with the head, we don't know but that would explain the massive blood trail leading out to the entrance of the cavern and disappearing once it got to the dirt. It stunk pretty bad in there. Also looking around, we found small animal bones and just general signs you would of a general bear den. It wasn't large, but fit just enough for a bear. It's safe to say we were pretty smart about our findings and left the cave and left that part of the area the rest of the day. And for the remainder of that trip, my dad and I would always discuss back and forth, what has the power to go in and kill a grizzly bear? Not only that, but rip its head clean off its body. Oh, and I don't want to forget to add that my dad thoroughly spent enough time looking at the body while I kind of stood outside, trying to get some fresh air, really trying to inspect everything that went on. He said... He pretty thoroughly observed its body, saw no scratches, tears, cuts, bangs, broken bones. It's as if whatever came in there just came in the cavern, barely even fought the bear, ripped its head off, and left. The bear was found lying on its side, or at least its body was, so it doesn't appear to be much of a fight or struggle. Something came in there and overpowered an adult male grizzly bear. Now you tell me, what on earth has that kind of power?